Hello class, uh, my name is Professor Jeff Moore. Uh, I'm a professor of geology geophysics. Uh, I'm also part of the geological engineering program. And um, normally I would be here in person uh, giving this lecture and presentation to you. Um, times being what they are, I'm happy enough to be able to talk to you this way. So um, I'm recording this on a video, it's narrated, and I'll uh, use the pointer along. I'll also post this just as audio along with the PDF of lecture slides in case the video size gets out of hand. Um, there's actually a bit of sound that goes in the video, um, and really I don't know how that's all going to mix together, so be patient with me, um, and uh, let's just give it our best. So the topic today um, is structural health monitoring of rock arches. Now, um, I think it goes without saying for most people in this class that, that arches of south, southeastern Utah in particular are some of the most unique geological features on Earth. There's really nowhere like our backyard on Earth that has these structures. These are natural sculptures sculpted by the environment through erosion into sandstone. Um, and, and of course, the popularity of somewhere like Arches National Park uh, is evidence of the fact that people are drawn from all over the world to experience these uh, natural sculptures. But with that comes some difficult and I think interesting management questions um, sur surrounding issues to balance conservation but also visit allowing visitation and managing visitation in a safe and also respectful way. Um, so, you know, land managers are asking these questions and in general, the point of this setup is that there's generally a lack of scientific and hard data that helps them. And that's kind of where our project's trying to build in. So some of these questions are, for example, this is Musselman Arch in Canyonlands National Park. Now, it's no longer, um, allowed to walk on arches and arches in Canyonlands National Park, but for many years it was. And the question arose, will people walking on an arch damage the structure? Varying opinions on this. Some people would say no, the, the weight of, of a person, or in this case several people, is insignificant as compared to the weight of the rock or the arch. Other people would say, like me, would say, well, it's not so much the absolute weight, it's rather what are the forces exerted by the people compared to the forces that the arch naturally feels and where those come from are places like wind. Um, so what's the, what's the force of these group of people as compared to what the arch might feel during heavy winds? And of course, you know, people don't only just walk on the arch, they did all manner of silly things. And um, simply for the preservation of this feature, I think it was a wise choice to um, to keep people off of these arches. Uh, this is Rainbow Bridge, uh, side Lake Powell, southeastern Utah, border of Arizona. Um, really one of the world's most spectacular natural uh, arches or bridges. And um, question I was asked, you see an image here of the bridge from a helicopter tour. Um, I was asked, um, can helicopters excite damaging resonance of this uh, natural bridge. That was a very interesting question. I wasn't immediately prepared for, um, and it's led down a path of, of many years of work and, and discovery on my part, um, some of which I'll, I'll turn back to that at the end to show you an example uh, helicopter. But um, needless to say, that's an interesting and very challenging question that's posed to land managers, or land managers are, are posing you know, wanting it to keep the structural stability and health of the arch in their best interest, uh, but at the same time, balancing interest from helicopter tour companies and, and interested tourists who want to see the arch from the air. And um, so they have to evaluate whether that's a safe practice or not, and, and then how to keep it a safe practice. Um, Another example, uh, this is Sunset Arch. It's in um, es Grand Staircase Escalante. And it's one of the arches that was um, evicted from National Monument Protection during the 2017 um, Trump uh, boundary revisions. And um, the question arose, 
um, you know, how will this arch be affected um, by this change in land status if extractive activities come in here? I mean, the reason this area was singled out is because there's potential coil, coal and oil reserves. What if some of those extractive activities start up? Could they have the potential to damage this arch? Um, how so? How would we know? Um, and so on. So in general, I think the, the point I'm trying to set up here is that there's quite a lot of interesting questions that arise, um, you know, recognizing that these arches are spectacular, unique features, um, demanding really the utmost of, of conservation management, but also recognizing that uh, they're not going to be just left alone out there. If people are going to come, people are going to bring various forces with them. Um, how can we best manage these arches where we balance this uh, need for conservation with also, you know, the desire and also the need to let people experience these arches. Okay, so here's the message of my presentation today. Um, and I'll return to this uh, throughout and uh, again at the end. But these are the three main points that I, I want to convey. Uh, the first is that rock arches are constantly vibrating. The second is the tune they sing measures their health. The third is we've only begun listening to what they have to say. Here you see, of course, in this image, Corona Arch. Um, and before I go further, I'm going to hone in on this idea of this tune they sing um, rather than build up to something and then sort of uh, maybe let you down with this weird hum that they make. I'm going to get right to it and, and let you experience the the hum, the tune that, that these arches are singing. And what you're going to hear in the next slides is vibration measurements, ambient vibration data, simply sped up so that the vibration can be experienced as sound. So remember that this is not sound recordings you're hearing, it's vibration recordings. And the arches vibrate with a set of tones that are uh, their resonant frequencies. And when I speed the vibrations up, then you hear those tones as sound. And it's not like they're, you know, clear tones, uh, and each one is different. But that's, again, what you're hearing. So let's just walk through a couple arches. Hopefully you can hear the sound. I can hear it. I don't know how loud it's going to be. I'm sorry. <laughs> This is the ambient vibration of Corona Arch. I'll switch. This is the ambient vibration of Rainbow Bridge. This is the ambient vibration of Aqueduct Arch. Now what you were hearing there in each of those little pops was actually a different days worth of data. What I did is I took a few minutes out of like five consecutive days and I was trying to to um, see if I could hear how the resonant frequencies were changing in this arch over time. And you, so you could hear a little bit, it was a little bit different from day to day. We're going to return to this arch um, at the end of the presentation when we talk about how these measure, how these frequencies change over time. So what was that? Um, you know, that, that was the ambient vibration. In fact, the ambient resonance of several rock arches. So, so structures at the Earth's surface, that's a building, um, it's a rock structure, it's all manner of freestanding uh, civil and geological structures are vibrating all the time. These vibrations happen to be very, very tiny um, and create 
imperceptible movements for the most part, but they are nonetheless always happening. They are stimulated by sources like wind, uh, also earthquakes, also cultural noise sources, and we'll see examples of, of some of those here. So this, this stimulating of the natural resonance uh, of or the natural uh, vibrational modes of a structure is called resonance. And that's what we're actually measuring. And you can see how we're measuring that. Um, here is um, our undergraduate assistant, Ben White. I'm on slide 10. Um, and he's placing a seismometer, this little green canister on Rainbow Bridge. Uh, here we are for scale. It was quite an ordeal to get up on top of the Rainbow Bridge. And that sensor is just right here on the side of Rainbow Bridge. We, we couldn't go out further. Uh, it was advised that it would be not safe to climb up this portion of the bridge. And at something like uh, 88 meters high above Bridge Creek here, um, that, that's maybe a fair decision. So our team takes compact broadband seismometers, the same kind of instruments that they use to monitor earthquakes and record earthquakes. And um, we simply place them on the rock on the top side of an arch. Um, here you see um, our, our first master's student, Allison uh, Dorsey, now Allison Starr, um, placing a seismometer uh, on Surprise Arch. And this is in the fiery furnace area of um, Arches National Park. And it's a wonderful arch, um, sort of hidden. You have to come through here. Really beautiful, slender arch. Um, we take these very expensive, uh, very, very sensitive seismometers, place them on the arch, just set them with their little feet here. You can see in the image at upper left. Um, and we level them and arrange, align them to north. Uh, then we take that very expensive setup and cover it with a $5 plastic water cooler we bought at Walmart, which just keeps the uh, sun and the wind off the sensor itself. It's really akin to like uh, that cover on a microphone that you might have. We then walk away. We record ambient vibration. That's just the natural ongoing constant vibration of the arch for anywhere between one and 24 hours. And when we're done, we pick up the sensor, take it home. There's no permanent um, marks. There's, there's no anchoring. Um, there's, there, it's completely non-destructive and non-permanent um, for the arch. So it's just rested there on the arch, then we take it away. Now, if we want to come back, what's cool about the technique as well is we don't actually have to cite the instrument in exactly the same spot. Um, so we can put it pretty much anywhere and record some of the same information that we're looking at recording. Um, we have study sites in Arches, I've shown Canyonlands, you've seen an example, Bryce Canyon National Park, also Natural Bridges National Monument, Rainbow Bridge National Monument, as well as BLM and state lands all over Utah. We have about 20 different arches we've measured, maybe 25 to this point. Uh, we've actually also moved on to measuring rock towers, we're measuring all kinds of things. Um, here's see uh, my PhD student Paul Geimer looking silly as he pops up through this really unique forked abutment of um, Two Bridge in Bryce Canyon. Um, it's this really slender, long, flatline bridge, and this boulder came rolling down the creek and slammed right into it and roll, you know, leans up against it. This forked tongue is really unique. Right over here, there's actually a hole in the bridge. You can look up and just see right through it, this guy. Um, and here's Paul placing a seismometer at Landscape Arch. This is North America's longest arch. Um, yeah, I think 88 meters uh, is the span. Uh, really remarkably slender. Uh, this bit fell off in the 90s. Um, and at the time, there was a trail that came up underneath here. And so you could sit and look out um, on, through the arch to the landscape beyond. But after those rock falls, the uh, trail was closed. The Park Service couldn't, you know, be sure that that trail was safe and it, and it was closed. Um, so we, you know, we, of course, we have research permits to make these measurements to place our sensors on the arches. Um, also allows us to go in this area underneath Landscape Arch. So what are, we what are we recording? This is slide 13. We are recording ambient vibration. That's just the vibration, we, we record vibration velocity natively out of a seismometer. So we record vibration over time. And you can see an example here. We have something like 20 hours from Rainbow Bridge. Um, and at the beginning of the test, we have sort of higher vibration amplitudes and it gets really windy for a time and then it gets pretty quiet um, and it's pretty quiet for the rest of our test. 
Um, and so this is, you know, what we what we're seeing in our ambient vibration uh, time series record. And and frankly, it's not too useful. There's not a lot that we're getting out of that. We see that it was windy. It's quiet. We also see there's these spikes every now and again. That's actually three earthquakes that we recorded. Um, and I'll play one of these for you now as sound, so you can hear what an earthquake sounds like when experienced as vibration by an arch. Hopefully you heard that okay. There's this kind of uh, a bit like a gun blast in a way or something where you have like a boom, boom. So the first arrival is the P wave, of course, and then comes the second wave. So you always have this with earthquakes coo -coo sound with these two with these two main arrivals, the P and S waves. Again, not too useful. We're not getting too much out of this particular um, data just in its raw form. Really what we want to do is to look at the power spectrum, uh, to look at the frequency spectrum of those data. So finding out um, where the power lies, at which frequencies have the most power. Um, and, and examples here, again from Rainbow Bridge, you can see um, for uh, some of our measurements here, um, this sensor here on the bridge is called Rab C, and the one on the uh, canyon bottom, which is a local reference, we call Rab D. And so you can see in red, the Rab C readings have these very distinct um, peaks of uh, spikes at distinct frequencies, um, and that those are not um, experienced the same, um, you know. 100, 200 meters away on the canyon floor at this reference sensor, Rab D. So these peaks at 2.2, 2.5 hertz are not present on this sensor. So these are really local phenomena. Um, I forgot to mention, I should back up, the sensors record three components of vibration. So um, two horizontal components, north, south, and east, west, I'm showing here, and then there's also a vertical component. So three orthogonal components of motion. So from this, we actually get a uh, vector with uh, orientation of ground motion as well, which becomes really important. So the hypothesis leading in is that, you know, these very strong, distinct peaks that we see in the frequency spectrum for the sensors on the arch are the resonant frequencies of the arch that we're sensing from ambient vibrations. Um, this is, you know, the same kind of thing that the engineers use for uh, measuring the, the resonant frequencies of buildings and bridges. Um, it's, it's just now we're, we're dealing in much smaller motions and natural structures, but we're, we're resolving essentially the same information. Before I go on, uh, maybe some of you are noticing this peak. This is what's called the microseism. You can see that it's felt equally on both the reference sensor and the bridge sensor. This is very low frequency energy created by the uh, world's oceans. And so we, this just, uh, this is something we measure everywhere in all our data, but it really goes to, um, demonstrate how sensitive um, our measurements are and how tiny these vibrations actually are that we're measuring, that we measure in this response of the world's oceans all the way in one of the most remote parts of southeastern Utah. Okay, so we have these frequency peaks in the spectrum and we're trying to imagine, you know, what these, what these are. We have this hypothesis from just looking at this kind of plot that we that these are the resonant frequencies of the bridge, but we need to take that further. And so, the and the, um, the study of that is what we call modal analysis. Now, you see the same data at left, except here also showing the vertical spectrum. Not um, super valuable. Modal analysis, you all sort of intuitively might know if you imagine, for example, a guitar string or any kind of stringed instrument. Um, it's a string fixed at two ends, and if you pluck it, it vibrates, and that vibration is what produces the sound. Now, if you pluck it and you analyze, would actually analyze the sound produced in the sound spectrum, you would see that there's not just one frequency being produced at this first mode or the fundamental mode, but there's actually a whole series of overtones being produced. And this, I'm just showing the second mode here in this simple diagram. And what's key about these two modes is that the first mode is like the whole string bending just as one. The second mode you can see makes a sine wave and there's what we call a nodal point right here in the center where the movement is actually zero. So you have one nodal point for the second mode and the third mode would have two nodal points and so on. So these are the natural vibrational modes of a simple resonator of a guitar string. 
this is actually our recreated simulated vibration of Rainbow Bridge at its fundamental mode, which happens to be 1.1 hertz. And you can see that it's, that it's very similar in that way. It's just a kind of full height bending of the bridge uh, back and forth. So this is this idea of modal analysis. And so what we're doing when in this process is we're taking our data and we're trying to build a model that recreates our data. So how do we do this? Well, it starts with 3D photogrammetry. So we take uh, ground or drone-based images of the uh, arch that we're measuring, and we use Agisoft or Bentley Context Capture to create a 3D geometric model, surface model of the arch from this photogrammetry. That model here looks like so, and you can see a bunch of our models here on our Sketchfab account, uh, sketchfab.com slash shmarch. We have a bunch of models. You can see those in VR as well. They're kind of fun if you have VR glasses. So we take that model, then we import that into a finite element simulation. For that, we use a commercial finite element program called Compsol Multiphysics. Uh, here's the mesh imported. Uh, it has to be all cleaned up and made into a solid, trimmed away and everything. And then we're going to decide where we want to fix the, the, the body. So here it's easy. We just fix the, the base, the two bases here. And then we model the vibrational properties. And uh, finite element has a slick way of doing this where you don't have to give it an input or anything in like the time domain, actual vibrations. It actually just solves for the distribution of, of mass and stiffness of the arch given material properties of density and, and uh, elastic modulus. And it predicts the vibrational modes from this information alone. This is called eigenfrequency analysis. Um, and so the results look like so. And here you're actually seeing the second mode of vibration of Rainbow Bridge. And you can see that it has a nodal point right here in the center of the bridge. Um, and you know, so that's, we get this picture of this modal displacement. And so what we're able to compare then to our data are the frequency of uh, the, here, the second mode, and uh, so we should be matching frequencies, but we should also be matching polarization vectors. So our sensor is somewhere, it's here with this yellow star, so somewhere over here. And so that's predicting, you know, motion that's essentially like this with respect to the trend of the bridge. And that's these two dots down here. So showing that the modeled and the measured polarization um, uh, information matches. So this is how we're looking to match the model to our field data. Um, and from that, we then get this rather enriched view of modal displacement. So there's mode one of Rainbow Bridge, mode two, mode three is a bit of a dance. Start getting more complex shapes. Mode six is torsion, you can see, torsional mode. Mode seven, getting more and more complex. As you go higher and higher, they get more complex. Um, and so, of course, if you look on the right hand side, you see our measured frequencies and here's our modeled frequencies and you can look through here and see that we've done pretty good. Uh, in fact, we missed a mode, it looks like in our measurements. Uh, it could be because it's close to the other ones. It could be because our sensor was just poorly placed to capture it. Um, it could be because it's much smaller uh, in just in amplitude than the others. I'm not sure, but nonetheless, we did miss a mode. Now, obviously the simulation showed greatly exaggerated uh, displacements. Um, these movements are real. They're constantly happening, but they are the scale of micrometers and sub micrometers. So there's extremely tiny movements. The simulation just exaggerates them uh, tremendously so that we can see them. Here's another example. This is Moonshine Arch. And you can hear the vibration in the background. First mode. second, third mode now. Fourth mode, fifth mode. Moonshine Arch is out near Vernal. Um, it's a cool arch. It's a bit unexpected. This is Navajo Sandstone out by Vernal. Um, this is two of my PhD students here um, on, this, on the arch. So it's rather large, uh, really accessible, really beautiful. So if you're ever out there, I encourage you to pay a visit. All right, so I hope to sort of convince you my first point, 
Rock arches are constantly vibrating, and what's more, we can measure that vibration from ambient seismic data. That means we don't have to stimulate it, we don't have to, to hit it or use a modal shaker. You know, when they do this for buildings, oftentimes they'll, they'll get this big vibrating, um, like monstrous vibrating weight and put it on top of the building on the bottom and really shake the building. We don't have to do that for arches. Ambient vibration is enough, even when it's super quiet. If wind comes up, they vibrate harder, but they're nonetheless always vibrating. So the next point I want to talk about is the second one. The tune they sing measures their health. We've already heard what that tune is, and we've already s discussed that that tune is created um, by each arch having a unique set of resonant frequencies. And when I sped them up, they each created their own kind of voice. Um, but it's these individual resonant frequencies, um, which now we're interested in as a state of health structural health monitoring um, technique. Um, the only equation in the whole presentation, um, but so that you understand, the natural frequencies of an arch are controlled by the geometry and material properties. In terms of material properties, there are only two, stiffness and mass. So here we have resonant frequency proportional to the square root of stiffness over mass, slide 21. You can intuitively already know that a little bit, shown up at, at these diagrams. Uh, on the right-hand side, if I have a ball on a stick and I sort of pluck that ball into motion, it'll vibrate at one frequency. What if I made that stick stiffer? Then it would vibrate faster. We'll take the same ball now and instead m make the, the ball a lot bigger, make it heavier. And if I flick that one, it would vibrate a lot slower. So we're seeing the resonant frequency go down as mass has gone up. We're also seeing the resonant frequency go up as stiffness goes up. So just like shown here in this equation. So it turns out that since we can easily recognize and measure these resonant frequencies, we can use that measurements over time to detect changes in resonant frequencies and relate those to changes in material properties. If mass goes up, for example, what if, what if it snows or rains and the arch gains a bunch of water in the pore spaces, then the resonant frequency might go down. Uh, if stiffness goes down, on the other hand, the resonant frequency would also go down. Why does stiffness go down? Well, stiffness is a function of damage. Rock becomes softer as cracks accumulate. Therefore, if we observe a permanent decrease in resonant frequency between successive measurements, we have indication that there has been some potential um, damage to the rock in the arch. So this is the whole basis for structural health monitoring. Again, this is not our invention. This is something that's been around for, for nearly 100 years. Um, and we're just now really for the first time bringing this to the world of, of geophysics, geological engineering, whatever you want to call it, um, using this approach to monitor the structural health of natural rock arches. For example, this uh, data series was started in the late 60s. This is the Caltech Millikan Library, and you're looking at two resonant frequencies here, one at like 1.4, one at about 1. 9 hertz uh, right after the building was built and it's this particular north-south one which is up here at 1.9 hertz and you can see over time that there's been a decrease in resonant frequency and that has not been gradual in fact it's been stepwise and that the steps each of these significant drops in resonant frequency correspond to major earthquakes so each of those earthquakes then goes that has created some damage in the building, cracked a column or loosened a joint. And in the net, the building has gotten softer. And uh, by this softening, the resonant frequency has gone down and it's gone down permanently. That softness is not recovered. It's a permanent drop. So which you see here just in the red line that I've highlighted here on slide 22, the stepwise red line. So we can do that. Uh, here's uh, the original data I showed you from uh, Rainbow Bridge, 1.1 uh, hertz resonant frequency. Uh, that was created in 2015. 
Uh, we came back two years later and measured it again. And you can see uh, this green line down here at the bottom. Um, we didn't go on top this time. We went actually um, down here at the bottom. So it's not as clear data. Uh, there nonetheless, you can make out, you know, 1.1, 2.2, 2.5, uh, something else potentially here. 4.2, um, we don't really see the 5 so much. That's the one we actually missed in our measurements. Uh, then 5.4. Uh, maybe the six even so you can see basically they track there's no change detected uh, between these so that's you know something of a boring measurement for us but it's a great measurement uh, to have to be able to share with the park service that says look during this two-year period I don't know what happened all to the bridge we weren't here uh, but we can say to the best of our knowledge and resolution that the bridge has not experienced any permanent damage um, at least in bulk as a bulk, you know, large scale mechanical feature in this interval. Now, here's another example, Corona Arch. Um, you can see some measurements between 2013 and 2016. This is slide 24. Uh, when we started August 2013, the first resonant frequency was 2.86. May 2015, it had gone down to 2.75. February 2016 had gone even down further at 2.66 and you can see that the, the second resonant frequency was tracking exactly the same in terms of percent change between measurements. Each time it went down and it had dropped actually by 7%. Uh, that that's, doesn't seem like a large amount but it is in fact a very large amount and it also just to show you that that change is really easily detectable even by the eye between these measurements. So we thought okay we're on to something but some of the astute among you are realizing right away that this is the hottest time of the year. This is uh, spring and this is one of the colder times of the year. And so maybe resonant frequencies are tracking temperature somehow. Indeed, we went back May 2016 and they had jumped right back up to where they were in May 2015. So we have some apparent wander of the resonant frequency that is happening uh, with changing temperature, something I'll talk about in the next set of slides. So we're now on the hunt for resonant frequency shifts with this idea, this concept of structural health monitoring. Um, and I, you know, some of our sites, for example, Landscape Arch, uh, we've really observed no resonant frequency shifts. Uh, Mesa Arch here in Canyonlands, beautiful arch, measured there a lot. That has a strong seasonal signal like Corona Arch did, um, but really, can't say that we've seen any permanent change. Uh, here's North Window, we've measured it there a couple times. Rainbow Bridge, of course, and, and Minion. I mean, it's not like they're just, you know, falling down and breaking out there all the time. This is a slow process. The desert is slow. Um, even though when we can't say that we've observed uh, a change, uh, it's still valuable nonetheless. I think we still produce valuable data um, to say that there hasn't been a change, you know, in terms of landscape arch and think about, for example, you know, the when this fell off, they were asking, well, is the arch gonna collapse? Uh, how could you know that? Um, well, I think we're establishing the data that, that can allow us to begin to say that. So if somebody really wants to look closely at an arch, uh, we're, we're really establishing the method to do that. Okay, so my second point, uh, the tune they sing measures their health, which leads me to the third point. We've only begun listening to what they have to say. So if we recognize that we can hear this tune, and this tune, which is the resonant frequencies of the arch, of course, contains information, structural, mechanical information about the rock feature itself, now what we know we need to pay close attention to this and monitor it over time and really begin to interpret this language that uh, is new to us um, and see what these arches are, are experiencing. So I'm going to bring you first to Aqueduct Arch. Remember that drone video from the canyon um, at the beginning of the presentation. And you just see, you know, some data from 2017. Here's March, April, May, June. Um, you can see temperature in black in gradually increasing with a really strong daily temperature signal. Um, and then you see the winds in, in red. But what is interesting here is if you look at the first resonant frequency, you can see that it's not stationary at all. In fact, it's quite wildly wandering. Every day it's changing. And in, over the seasons and weeks and months, it's also changing. And it just appears, just to the first order, that it's changing uh, 
in conjunction with temperature, like we thought maybe we were seeing at Corona Orange. So looking at that a little further, what we can do is relate first resonant frequency here on the y-axis, slide 29, to uh, air temperature here on the x-axis. And you see it looks a bit like this kind of hockey stick look. And there are two parts of this that I really want to point out. One is that for the majority of this um, relation, we see that, in general, as temperatures increase, frequencies go up. Now, you can see here a general, like a long-term trend. This is, you know, between July or between February and July. And you can also see this like flatter slope. These flatter, smaller changes are the daily changes. And this long-term, large-scale, um, positive linear trend is the seasonal change between February and July. So we have a frequency increase with temperature that we think relates to what we call thermal stiffening. That is, as the arch warms up, it expands. But as a lintel uh, feature itself, structural feature, it is constrained on the side. So a as it tries to expand, it actually increases axial stresses along the axis of the arch. And those axial stresses press against the rock. They press grain boundaries closer together. They press cracks closed. And all of that pressing, that increase in axial stress, causes the arch to become a little bit stiffer. By closing cracks, you cause the arch to become a little bit stiffer. But that's a reversible effect. So if I take away that heat, take away that, that thermal expansion, and the, and the arch cools down and contracts, then I would drop back down this line back down to here. So this is one aspect, thermal stiffening. The other aspect is what happens down here. Now you can see that when temperatures drop below freezing, we again get an increase. And an increase means, again, stiffening. Increased frequency means the rock is stiffening. So what's happening here? Well, we think in this case, we have actually some amount of ice formation in the arch uh, at sub-freezing temperatures, which stiffens this. And now it's, this arch is not saturated by any means. So what we think actually happened is that this ice exists. It's like a meniscus, if you like, at the... Uh, at grain contacts, and it's not a lot of water there, but just enough at the, that sort of irreducible water that when it freezes, you're basically stiffening each of these grain contacts. And so in the bulk, the rock mass itself stiffs, stiffens, and we can measure that as an increase in frequency. An interesting way to visualize that, each one of these dots is a day. Um, and you can see some of these blue dots, how once they drop below freezing, they rise up, rise up, and then as the sun comes up, boom, they drop back down. So you can see time over here. Rise up, rise up, rise up, rise up, sun's out, boom, they drop back down. You've just heard another earthquake. This is Musselman Arch, um, and these are data actually recorded by Ashley Rasson. She was uh, one of the first MISTI um, teachers that I worked with. Um, pause that. Um, that was Musselman Arch here in Canyonlands National Park, and again, um, you heard the arch vibrating during an earthquake, and that earthquake was actually quite small, magnitude 2.2, and it was about 150 miles away epicenter near Panglitch. Here on the top, you can see the velocity. The blue is the sensor on the arch, and the red is the sensor just over here by this bush, just off the arch. And what you can see is that the arch felt a very much stronger vibration than just off the arch, than the reference sensor just off the arch. And if I look at that as a ratio with respect to frequency, what I see is that at the resonant frequency of 4 hertz, which is an up and down bending, vertical bending of the arch, that the motion, ground motion on the arch was actually 160 times stronger than just off to the side of the arch on bedrock. That means for a small, for, for any kind of indu or any shaking event like this earthquake, the arch actually responds by shaking 100 times stronger, more than 100 times stronger than surrounding bedrock. And we think that this has important implications 
for how the arch might, it's, might experience damage during these kinds of events if it shakes a hundred times harder than nearby bedrock. Um, this is my last example. It's, it's about helicopters again. Um, and this is Bryce Canyon. Here's Two Bridge. Uh, and this is the um, tourist helicopter that flies out of the Bryce Canyon Airport, um, operated by um, uh, operator conjunction with Ruby's Inn locally there. It's a two-blade helicopter. It's a Bell 206. Um, and um, maybe you don't know, most people don't, but helicopters generate infrasound from their main rotor. So the, actually the loudest sound that helicopters generate is at frequencies you can't hear, subsonic frequencies. Um, and a two-blade helicopter, in fact, generates 13 hertz infrasound. Um, and the, the frequency is related to how many blades it has and how fast they spin. So it makes 13 hertz infrasound and it makes overtones on top of that. So 13, 26, 39 hertz, and so on. Now, helicopters produce this like steady sound energy, but as they fly through the air, this energy gets Doppler shifted from an observer's perspective on the ground, just like the ambulance passing by you, siren sounds higher on the way in and lower on the way out. Um, that's the Doppler shift, and helicopters do the same. The, uh, the sound energy they're producing is constant frequency, but they're always moving. So if you're an observer on the ground, you hear, you would experience that infrasound, you can't hear it, uh, at, as changing frequencies. Now, it turns out the two bridge uh, vibrates in its fundamental mode up and down at 13 hertz, which is exactly, precisely the same frequency of infrasound emitted by this particular two-blade helicopter flying over Bryce Canyon several times a day. Now, it, we monitor here, the, the red is the velocity curve, so this is just ambient vibration of two bridge, and what we've observed is as the helicopter passes by, the vibration of two bridge increases in amplitude by about 100 times. And what's happening is that this sound energy is stimulating resonance. So here you can see it in a spectrogram. A spectrogram has time on the x-axis, frequency on the y-axis, and then power uh, on the third axis. So in the color scale with the color bar here, you have power. And you can see this Doppler shifted energy as these wavy lines here on slide 33 of, uh, in the spectrogram. So here, the fundamental here is at 13 hertz, second uh, overtone um, at second frequency at 26, but it's quite Doppler shifted. Third would be at 39 if, if it were steady, but it's quite Doppler shifted. And you see here in these lines, these flat lines that go throughout the spectrogram, these are resonant frequencies of the bridge of two bridge. And in fact, there's one at 13 hertz. There's another here at about 29 hertz. There's another at 39 hertz. And what you see from this are these red uh, increases in power, these, these really strong jumps in power that ex happen exactly when the infrasound energy, Doppler shifted infrasound from the helicopter is exactly at the fundamental frequency of the arch. The vibration increases in amplitude by a factor of 100 times. Now, these vibration amplitudes are very small. This helicopter is actually, you know, 600 meters away. So it's not like it's, it's instantaneously damaging to the arch. Nonetheless, I don't think anybody at the helicopter company or the park service, well, they know because I've told them, know this exists or even necessarily what to do with this information. So this is something we're actively working on in a PhD project. Um, uh, just finish this off by letting you hear this. Again, keep in mind what you're going to hear is uh, vibration, not sound, vibration of the arch. So you heard the arch vibrating, it's kind of a weird sound, and then you heard the helicopter come in, and it had this Doppler shift of tones, and it went and I think your ears could even sense that it came in, it actually circled around, circled around a part of another time, and left a different direction, and then it came in. If not, listen to it again, and see if you can get that. The ears are really good at picking out uh, spatial changes from sound, from Doppler shifts. Uh, it's pretty remarkable. 
Okay, so there's my third point, and we come to the end of my presentation. Really, we've only begun to, you know, hear this this language that um, comes out of measuring the ambient vibration, the ambient resonance of rock arches, um, and and understand what what the arches have to tell us. You know that they experiencing earthquakes, that they feel helicopters, that they resonate a hundred times stronger, or that you know all these they're changing all the time. There's all this great cool information that we're learning while we're on this search, you know, for permanent changes in resonant frequencies that it might indicate damage. Um, I just want to uh, end um, by recognizing that a lot of the information and, and figures you've seen uh, were generated by my PhD students, wonderful PhD students, Paul Geimer and Riley Finnegan, um, and uh, we're funded by the National Science Foundation and, of course, permitted for work in the parks uh, and also partly uh, financially supported by the National Park Service. So thank you for um, paying attention <laughs> remotely. Um, and um, my email's on the front. Uh, here's our Twitter handle uh, at the bottom if you want to connect with us. Thanks again. <laughs>